Today, I am joined in this revisit episode by Dr. Sarah Morris to talk about the state of mind of Anne Boleyn leading up to her execution. The Tudor's Dynasty Podcast. Sarah, welcome to the show. Oh, hi, Rebecca. It's really lovely to be here. Thank you for inviting me. I'm so excited to have you on because today we are going to talk about kind of the state of mind of Anne Boleyn. And you had written an article that I thought was fascinating um, about her state of mind. But before we go into all of this, um, just I, I don't want to keep saying fascinating information, but it's just to me, it's something that I'd never read before. So can you please tell the listeners um, what makes you qualified to be able to discuss this topic today? Yes, because it is a topic that perhaps we don't often go into in so much detail. Um, but although I online am the Tudor Travel Guide and, and I write and I blog and I vlog and I podcast about Tudor places, um, actually, before I came to... Um, this particular work that I do now. Uh, I was first of all a medical doctor uh, for a number of years and uh, was part of the training to be a doctor. You obviously engage in certain amount of training around psychology. However, my current main job <laughs> alongside being the Tudor Travel Guide is as an executive coach. And I've been doing that for about 20 years now. So I work with leaders, people. Um, and um, of course, therefore, I spend a lot of my time thinking about psychology, people's values, beliefs, mindsets, and behavior. And I'm particularly interested in one particular facet of psychology that determines how we see ourselves, the world, and how we turn up and behave. And that is our ego. And we'll come back to that later because that will become very relevant. And I hope your listeners will then see why I was so fascinated uh, when I came across the article that we're going to be discussing, which led to me then writing this article about Anne Boleyn's state of mind as she approached her execution. Now, before we really get into that, let's talk to those who maybe are living under a rock, <laughs> who don't <laughs> know who Anne Boleyn is. We do have some listeners who are brand new to the tutors. So for them, Sarah, who was Anne Boleyn? Yeah, so let's start with the facts. So um, Anne Boleyn was the second wife, queen consort of Henry VIII. Uh, Henry VIII married Anne Boleyn in 1533 after a, around about a six-year courtship, putting aside, of course, his wife of over 20 years, uh, the Spanish, Spanish princess, queen Catherine of Aragon. And of course, in the process of doing so, Henry really turned the country upside down uh, by divorcing himself from the Pope in the process and making himself supreme head of the church in England. So um, the whole of the events that surrounded Anne Boleyn and her relationship with Henry, with Henry caused an incredible amount of um, cultural, social and religious turmoil in the country. It was an enormous and significant event. Um, Anne Boleyn, of course, in due course, gave birth to a daughter, Elizabeth I, possibly one of England's greatest queens. But unfortunately, she failed to give Henry VIII the son, the heir that he craved and desired. And in a perfect storm of events, and we're not here to dis dissect those today, that's probably a podcast in its own right. But she eventually, shall we say, to use a Tudor phrase, fell from the king's graces and ended up being arrested and taken to the tower on charges of uh, treason, um, adultery, incest, etc. And of course, famously, she was the first of Henry's queens to be beheaded. So that's who she is factually. Who is she to me? Well, she's my historical heroine, I will confess, uh, since I was about 11 years old. Um, so yes, I've had a long-standing love affair and fascination with Anne Boleyn. She's the, well, she's actually, she's a bit, uh, to be truthful, in some ways, she's a bit like Marmite. Now, I'm not sure whether all your listeners overseas will know what Marmite is. Do you know what Marmite is, Rebecca? Mm, I just know it's some kind of jelly. 
it's like a, I don't know whether it's like Vegemite that you, do you have Vegemite in the US? No, we don't. No, you don't. I okay. Mean, I'm getting you... myself confused. So Marmite is a, a spread and it's made of yeast and it's, it's a very well known here in the UK. There's an advertising campaign that says you either love it or you hate it. Um, and I think Anne Boleyn as a character is a little bit like that. People, she either sweeps people off their feet and they fall in love with her because I think part of her personality calls to them. Or perhaps um, they, you know, don't like her on account of some of those personality traits and, and maybe the role she had in causing the divorce of Henry from Catherine. So, yes, she's, um, she's a force of nature. And I believe she was a woman who was ahead of her time. I always feel like those who are so enamored with Anne Boleyn that the reason they are is just because she was executed, that her execution kind of opened up her history to all of us centuries later. Well, it's an incredibly dramatic story, isn't it? It's got everything into it. It's got love and it's got passion and it's got betrayal and it's got drama and I think many people can't imagine what she went through and we'll be talking about some of that today. For me, I think that Anne Boleyn endures because she embodies certain qualities and, and I'm maybe I'm speaking very personally here, but I'm happy to share that with you. That and she's very courageous and I think that her courage is something that shines through, certainly at the end. And no matter what you think of her role that she played in the divorce of Henry divorce and Catherine of Aragon, it's very difficult. Even Chapuis, who was one of her, you know, one of her, shall we say, sworn enemies, to use another good Tudor phrase, um, admitted that she was braver than a lion. And I think for me personally, I I see her as a bit of a role model and I, I still look to that courage if I need to find it in myself. So that's part of why she has an attraction for me. Let's go to the arrest of Anne Boleyn. It, can you give us a bit of insight into maybe Anne's state of mind leading up to her arrest? Like, what do the accounts tell us? Mm. So here we are, um, the back end of April 1536. Um, things are not looking good between Henry and Anne. Jane Seymour is now on the scene. Um, Anne knows that something is up. She's clearly very nervous and agitated. She doesn't know what's happening, but we do know that she knew something was going on because just a few days prior to the May Day joust, which ultimately, of course, led up to her arrest the following day, she went to her chaplain, um, beseeching him, begging him, saying that if anything were to happen to her, could he look after, could he have a care for her daughter, Elizabeth? So, she must have been feeling anxious in the run up to the May Day joust. And of course, Henry stormed out of that joust. Um, and that was the last that Anne would ever see of him. Um, and in fact, then the palace, you know, people followed the king. So the palace deserted, but the king did not call Anne. So she was left behind at Greenwich. And I think actually at the moment she was arrested, uh, which which allegedly she was watching a game of real tennis um, at Greenwich. I think she was, she, she carried herself with a, a certain amount of dignity and calm at that stage. I mean, goodness knows what was going through her mind. Maybe it was like a swan, you know, she was, she looked regal and, but beneath the surface, maybe her feet metaphorically were paddling away. She must have been feeling anxious and scared, but, but I think, Outwardly, she at this stage managed to hold it together to use a, a you know, a common um, modern parlance. And that would be in contrast with what happened a little bit later uh, after she arrived at the tower. But, so, yes. So, so I think quite calm. She was obviously interrogated by the Privy Council at Greenwich and then um, dined in her presence chamber before the formal arrest warrant was read to her, I believe, if I remember rightly, by the Duke of Norfolk. And then she was taken that afternoon by barge to the tower. I had to look up again before we started talking today. Um, when she arrived at the tower, um, what she said to Master Kingston, um, could you tell everybody listening what she said when she met with Master Kingston at the Tower of London? Well, I think this point in which she arrives at the tower, um, heralds a change, an obvious change, a noticeable change in her behavior. So 
if she'd managed to hold it together up until that point, this is when her defences began to crumble and her sheer terror and anxiety began to show through. So she arrived at the court gate, not traitor's gate, as many people uh, you know, commonly believe, but at court gate, which was the stairs that was used by royalty to access the tower. And she was taken um, a- a- across the moat, uh, which was spanned by a bridge at that time. The moat is dry now, and into the under the into the court gate, which today is called the Bow- Bowood Tower. And when she was there at that point, she collapsed to the cobblestones for the first time. Obviously, it was just too much for her at this point, and she must have been utterly, utterly terrified. And she. She was accompanied, of course, by the likes of her uncle, the Duke of Norfolk, um, uh, other privy councillors who'd come with her by barge. And she basically fell to the floor in tears, hysterics probably, and begged them to to ask the king for mercy and that he would be good to her. And and at one point, of course, when she finally met with Kingston, uh, I think there might be some debate as whether she met with Kingston initially or whether she was met by the deputy uh, of the tower. But at some point she certainly said, um, you know, would she be conveyed to a dungeon? That's clearly what she had in mind. And of course, Kingston or whoever it was, but I believe it was Kingston, uh, was able to say to her, uh, no, of course, madam, you will be uh, you'll be housed in the apartments, the royal apartments, which were part of the royal apartments at the tower. They no longer exist now that had been refurbished and repaired for Anne um, prior to her coronation in 1533. So that must have been, I suppose, some shred of comfort and hope for her. It always breaks my heart when I when I hear those, or I sh- I didn't hear it because obviously I wasn't there. Mm. But when I read those things, trying to put myself into her shoes, which obviously isn't always so easy to do, but what a scary time for her! And one of the things um, I want to discuss um, before we actually move forward is uh, how long was she actually in the tower? Yeah, let's get a let's get a time frame in place. So she arrived on the second of May, but she was not finally executed to the nineteenth of May. So of course, there she's in the tower for what two and a half weeks of of uncertainty. And um, you know, it's interesting, Rebecca. You were saying you're trying to put yourself in her shoes. And I think that's a really important thing to do. And maybe your listeners could just pause for a moment and consider what Anne was facing. You know, if if somebody were to arrive at your house now and say to you that they're going to take you away from your family and that you're probably never going to see them again, and that you're going to be taken to a place which has a formidable reputation of people not emerging alive, and that you were possibly on the verge of losing everything you'd ever known and loved, how would you be feeling? I mean, you would, wouldn't you? You would be feeling utterly terrified, um, haunted even. And this is really important when we start to look at how remarkable it is in terms of what happened to Anne during those two and a half weeks from a psychological perspective. And that's what really fascinates me. And not only was she sitting in the tower, I'm sure contemplating her life and the life of her daughter, but she also had to think about her brother being locked up in the tower at the same time. Mm, Yeah, absolutely. Because of course, the arrest of Anne Boleyn, I think most historians would agree now, was a coup by Thomas Cromwell. And it was a, you know, eat or be eaten scenario. Anne and Thomas, if they had ever really gotten on, had definitely fallen out by this stage. And earlier on, um, I think it was it earlier in April, um, forgive me if I've got that wrong, but you know, a few weeks prior to her arrest, they'd gotten into a bit of an argument. And I think Thomas Cromwell felt that if he was not able to take Anne out, then it might be his neck on the block. But of course, the Berlin faction was very strong. There were people who would have been there to speak up for Anne, including her father and her brother. And so, you know, one of the... um, (sighs) 
the strokes of genius, I suppose, if you want to call it that, by Cromwell is that he managed to fabricate this plot of Anne being a wild and wanton woman who'd who'd uh, had multiple adulterous affairs, but had also had incest with uh, uh, with her brother, and of course those were on the grounds. Although she didn't know it when she when she was arrested, she didn't know the grounds that her brother had been arrested on. Um, that of course took him into the tower, and their relationship. It seems to me, from the research and writing I've done around Anne over the years, I think their relationship was very close. So she would have, yes, um, faced the possibility not only of the loss of her own life, but knowing ultimately, and she did ultimately find out, it took a few days to find out exactly who was arrested with her. But she would have had on her conscience the fact that good men, people she knew and loved, were imprisoned in the tower with her and their lives were also on the line. She had an incredible amount to deal with psychologically at this point. Before we talk about how she felt on the day of her brother's execution, I kind of want to go back a little bit about her psyche. And we had seen what had happened six years later to Lady Rochford, who obviously went mad in the tower awaiting her death. But Anne has always been portrayed, kind of as you said, stated as well, as very stoic. Um, in your article, you suggest that Anne experienced this shift in consciousness during her stay at the tower. Can you please elaborate on what you found? Yeah, absolutely. And in fact, I'm going to talk on two different levels because there's almost a macro process, which is interesting in its own right, that I can talk you through quite quickly. And then we're going to dive into the the article that you talk about, which really refers to the final few, probably hours, maybe a couple of days, hours of Anne's life, where maybe something really quite remarkable happened. So let me take the first one first. I think that when we look at the accounts, the eyewitness accounts, and although um, some of the accounts were lost uh, due to fire uh, in the archives since this time, obviously some of those letters have survived, thankfully. And so they give us this insight into the events that happened from the moment that Anne was arrested through to the moment she left the Queen's apartments and walked towards the scaffold. And I think that when you look at those events, you can see the four clear stages that today we know are associated with grief and and loss. And that's work done by the likes of, um, I think her name is Elizabeth Kubler-Ross, who did a, a lot of work on grief and dying. And we know that those four stages are, first of all, shock. Secondly, anger. Thirdly, denial and or bargaining or both. And then fourthly, acceptance. And I think we can see actually each of those stages in these contemporary accounts. So first of all, going back, we've already talked about how Anne arrived at the tower and how she just simply collapsed in hysteria. And I think that was this you see, Anne, in that shock, that phase of shock. My goodness, this can't be happening to me. Um and, 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 you know, just, just literally falling apart at that moment. And that's where I think we see shock. Now, moving forward a few days, a few days on, in fact, in those first few days, we know that Anne really was rambling a lot. Um, the king or Cromwell, more likely, had put about her four ladies who were not really Anne's friends. <laughs> and they were basically put there to spy on her. Um, and perhaps, um, you know, a wiser woman may well have kept her counsel. But I think you see Anne still in this phase of shock through these first two or three days because she rambles quite a lot. She reflects, for example, on the conversation that she had with Sir Henry Norris, which was the one that really got her into deep water um, when she accused Sir Henry Norris of looking for dead man's shoes, i.e. that he was hoping to replace the king after the king died. Um, which, of course, was just treasonous in and of itself. Um, and she she rambles and she implicates herself. And it was exactly what Cromwell was hoping she would do. And But I think she did that because she was in, still in shock at that phase. 
then we move forward. Now, we're into a little bit of slightly contentious ground here, Rebecca, because we're talking about the letter that was purportedly written by Anne Boleyn on the 6th of May. So we're, what, four days into her imprisonment now. Now, there is a you know debate. Was this letter written by Anne or not? Um, uh, it isn't her handwriting, I believe, but it's thought that, you know, it certainly expresses the kind of things that Anne would say. And if she did write it, and I'm I'm inclined to, I don't know what you think, but I'm inclined to believe she did. Um, what we see is, a, is real. You can feel the anger in those words. She's basically saying, I know you're having this relationship with this other woman whose name I will not mention, uh, but you know who I mean. And, you know, there's anger in that. Yes, she does beseech the king to be good to the other men who are arrested with her. Um, but she's quite brazen and bold. And I think that's anger coming through. So we've got our second stage. Then we move on to the sort of the bargaining denial phase. And I think we see this a little bit later on. Now, we've lost some of the contemporary accounts here, but you you do hear and talk about the fact that, you know, the king is trying to just test her. You know, maybe he'll send her to a nunnery. So she's, she's sort of avoiding uh, the enormity and terror of what might face her by thinking of this, this might be a way out, that might be a way out, this might not actually be happening to me. The third stage, denial. And then finally, and this is where we're going to really open this up and talk in some detail, but the final stage, of, as I said, is acceptance. And I think we see this uh, towards the end, and we're, we're going to go deeper into this, but we see it... Um, in the speech Anne gave after she was finally tried and accused, it's very calm. It's very matter of fact. She talks about her willingness to die. Um, there are times when, when, for example, Kingston finally arrives to take her to the scaffold and she says, acquit yourself of your charge. I have long been prepared. So there's no sense of hysteria in this. There's no sense of denial. There's just this sense of calm acceptance. So this is a a kind of a, a framework that we use today when we're thinking about people who are facing loss and grief. And I think we can see it in Anne. And I'm going to pause for a moment, but but yes, the natural stage from here is to go on and say, actually, I think there was a bit more to that last stage, or there could well have been something even more miraculous that happened at that point. So, so you're quite right. I am... Um, uh, well, we've, we've, you know, I've talked about my interest in psychology um, and it was a happen, happen chance, really. I was um, I was reading a book by a renowned transpersonal psychologist called Professor Steve Taylor. I believe he's at um, University of Leeds here in the UK. And Professor Taylor has done a lot of work on uh, the ego. And um, basically he he in his book, which is called Out of the Darkness, he talks about a specific psychological phenomenon, uh, which he calls SITE, S-I-T-E, which stands for Suffering Induced Transformational Experience. And basically, these are profound shifts in consciousness that people experience when they are facing severe trauma or turmoil or loss in which really their 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 sense of ego is disintegrates and in the disintegration of that sense of self that sense of ego and if you think it's appropriate that we talk a little bit more about what is the ego then we can certainly do that but that sense of self disintegrates and suddenly we're able to experience a profound expansion in our consciousness. Now, he calls these high intensity awakening experiences. Um, so it's like that grief process I talked to you about, but on, on acid, really. You know, it happens in very intense experiences where one's sense of self and everything that one holds to be true is blown apart because it's just under such intense pressure from the circumstances that bear down upon us. And in the loss of self, we are paradoxically, according to Steve Taylor, liberated. Now, in modern term parlance, we might use the word enlightenment, 
Um, now, you know, people may have different feelings about that word. Um, but essentially, that's what we're talking about. And that when somebody experiences such a, an, a high intensity and wakening experience, as I'm suggesting and might have, and we can see that all the conditions were present, um, you enter a deep, deep state of profound acceptance and peace. And you may well be aware of um, a biblical term, a peace that passeth, passeth all understanding. And that's really what we're talking about here. It's really something that is, well, it's a spiritual experience, really, uh, beyond the norm. And, and that is what I'm proposing Anne experienced as she faced probably the final day to day or two of her life. It's just heartbreaking. I mean, one of the things you might want to, you know, might be useful to say to those people listening is, is why, why did, why, why did I think that in the first instance? Well, if you just rewind our conversation, when I was asking people to imagine how would they feel if somebody arrived at their door saying, you know, basically we're taking you away and you, you're going to be facing, um, losing everything, you know, the people you love, your status. Um, in Anne's case, she had a lot of status. She had a lot of wealth. You know, um, she had a lot to lose. She was being ripped away from her daughter. She'd never see her daughter again. And at some level, she knew that. But why is it that when you look and read the eyewitness accounts that, that were of the day of Anne's execution, we have more than one account that talk about how profoundly peaceful and beautiful she looked. Now, now I don't know about you, Rebecca, but if I put myself in Anne's position and think of that very thing happening to me, and I'm entering into a period of, I don't know how long I'm incarcerated. My life is on the line. I'm losing people I've loved. I figure I probably wouldn't eat very much. I wouldn't sleep very much. I'd be terrified. And by the time I walked out to my execution, I would be looking haggard and drawn and haunted. And yet we've got more than one account that says exactly the opposite. So, for example, there was a Portuguese witness present that morning. And he quote, he's quoted as saying, never had the queen looked so beautiful. And then Lancelot de Carl, who's um, a, a, a Frenchman who wrote a few weeks after. I don't think he. I don't think he was actually present, but he wrote a, just a, a long account of Anne Boleyn's life, not long after uh, she died. And he stated that the Queen went to her execution with an untroubled countenance. And we have somebody else saying that when the Queen mounted the scaffold, she did so gaily. You know, that they couldn't imagine that she was even going to die. And those accounts had always really troubled me. Well, not troubled me, but I thought, what? What's going on here? How is that possible? Um, and it was bearing those things in mind when I read Professor Taylor's account that I started to think, hold on a minute. We know people go through psychological shifts when they face grief Anne Boleyn was facing such an intense set of circumstances that did it, did they, did they actually cause her defenses to completely, her ego defenses, the thing, the ego basically, for those people who may be going, what is the ego? The ego is our sense of self. It's, it's a combination of all our beliefs and values and experiences that make up the sense of who we are. I'm a daughter. I'm a mother. I'm a, I'm a coach. I, I like chocolate ice cream. Um, I, you know, I love puppies, you know, and all of these things, when you roll them all together, they make up this very complex sense of self identity and self. And each of us has an ego. And if I had to write a job description of the ego, it would be to keep us safe. It keeps you safe. The ego is there to try and keep you on safe ground, on comfortable ground, on ground that you feel secure in. And it will do all sorts of things to kind of shore that up. It, 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 it tries to collect wealth. It tries to collect possessions. It, it, 
tries to sort of firm up this sense of identity and and when everything is going well all is well but when the ego feels threatened and the ego is constantly scanning the environment for threats it will start to react with anxiety and fear. So, you know, if you ever felt outside your comfort zone, maybe somebody's asked you to speak in front of an audience and you hate speaking, you'll get palms will get sweaty, your heart will race. That's because your ego has been triggered and your inner dialogue of, oh my goodness, what will people think? Will I be good enough? That's been triggered. Now that's a minor, minor example that I hope many people listening can, can relate to. But in somebody in Anne's situation where she's facing the loss of absolutely everything, including her life, the intensity of pressure of the ego is so on the ego is so much that it literally falls apart. Now, also, Rebecca, you mentioned a very interesting point earlier. You talked about Jane Boleyn, uh, Lady Rochford, who was, of course, Anne Boleyn's sister, who ultimately went to the scaffold in 1542 for her complicity in Catherine Howard's adultery. Now, it's really well recorded. Now, she went through the same process of Anne, didn't she? She was arrested. She was taken to the tower. She'd seen her sister-in-law and her husband executed there. She knew what she was facing. And in the face of that similar um, onslaught of, of factors, what happened to Jane Boleyn was that she actually had a nervous breakdown. And interestingly, this is what Steve Taylor talks about in his book, Out of the Darkness. When the ego is under pressure like that, intensely under pressure, it can either fall apart and we have a what we would call a nervous breakdown, which, you know, we know Jane Boleyn went mad. And, and although I'm not an expert on Jane, if I remember rightly, and please correct me if I'm wrong, Rebecca, um, I think they had to change the law to allow her to be executed because up until that point, it was illegal to execute a mad person, I believe. That's true. So they changed it so that, thank you, by the way. <laughs> um, so they changed it so that, that she could be executed. So that's a, the example of a breakdown. Now, in this instance, what Steve Taylor is saying is this, there is another option. You can have a break up. So instead of disintegrating into madness, as I say, with the, with the kind of the breaking apart of the ego, you actually enter this higher state of consciousness where you connect to something which is beyond ourself, which is profound and spiritual in many ways. And, and, and at that point, you really enter a state of peace, peacefulness and fearlessness. And, it's well known and it's well recorded. And basically, Steve Taylor interviewed a lot of people who've been through incidents, you know, whether they be car accidents or life threatening illnesses that have really pushed them to their limit of what they thought they could endure. And he talks about this phenomenon that we see with these individuals, that they literally radiate this sense of peace, this profound aura of calm. And I think it's when I read that, that it just, because I'd done a lot of research on Anne Boleyn just prior to this, so I was very, very connected. I was writing my novel, Le Ton Viandre, a novel of Anne Boleyn. I was very connected to the story. And in many ways, I felt like I'd literally walked in Anne Boleyn's shoes to the scaffold with her. So it was very fresh in my mind. And I think when I read that, I thought, hang on a minute. Isn't that what those eyewitnesses are saying? when they talk about Anne as she approaches the scaffold. And, and that's really where I, um, I started to pull these two things together. Um, there's a little bit more evidence that might weigh in our favour here, because, of course, Rebecca, we can't prove this. <laughs> Unfortunately, we can't prove it. It's an interesting, it's a very interesting thing to muse on, but there is a little bit more evidence that might weigh towards um, the fact that Anne was probably predisposed to this. And may, may, may I talk about that a little bit? Of course. Yeah, go ahead. So there are, Steve, again, through his research, um, Steve says that really there are, there were, there were four predisposing factors out with the 
actual circumstances itself out, out with the turmoil or the trauma that predisposes people to have a break up um and i think each we can see evidence of of each of these factors in Amberlynn's life and in her character. So the first one, he says, is that people who tend to be very courageous and have a strong sense of realism are more prone to having these high intensity awakening experiences. Now, I don't know about you, but I've, we've already said that Anne Boleyn was noted by her contemporaries, by Chapuis, as being braver than a lion. Well, that's quite something. Um, and, and I think I think probably most people who know anything of her life would say that Anne, you know, she took on circumstances head on. You know, she she was no shrinking violet. Um, she she faced reality and she dealt with it. She confronted Henry. I mean, that's part of I think in the end what you know Henry got rather fed up of. She she really she didn't just sort of fade into the background. She was a strong woman. So I think we see that in her. So I think we've got one tick in the box there. The other factor he says is that the people who tend to need to be in control also have a greater tendency to experience these high intensity awakening experiences. And, um, you know, interestingly, you know, I think, I think, I think uh, Anne Boleyn was an alpha female. Uh, it's probably what attracted Henry VIII, who was an alpha male. Um, uh, and, you know, she took her destiny into her own hands. I am not one of these people who believe that she was a pawn of her father or her uncle Norfolk. I think they supported, I think they facilitated, but I think Anne knew exactly what she was doing. And interestingly, her badge, which is a falcon, which is sitting on a, a kind of, I think it's an, it's some kind of oak or a trunk. And I'm just going to refer to the, to the words here. It symbolizes one who does not rest until the objective is achieved, um, which is interesting. I did actually know that about her badge until I was doing this research on this article. I thought, well, there you go. And uh, that's, that's definitive proof. <laughs> she sounds like um, me a little bit. This is creepy. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I think this is I think this is why people connect with her because there are parts when you dig in and understand you see some of these things either you admire and aspire to or or you relate to. Well the third factor is he says that people who are right brainers i.e. creative are more likely to experience these sights or high intensity awakening experiences and you know, there's no doubt Anne was creative. You know, she she put poetry to music. She danced. She played music. You know, she what was it? She, she there was something in her dress every day that was a little different. You know, she was a bit of a trendsetter. So I think we can. I think it's quite clear that Anne was 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 very creative. And the reason why creativity is important is it it, it basically. Um, People who are creative tend to be more intuitive and they have a more emotional personality and that makes them more susceptible. And again, you know, if there's anything we know about Anne Boleyn, Rebecca, isn't it, is that she was temperamental. <laughs> <laughs> you know, she was temperamental. So there's that. And then finally, the final factor is gender. So women, women are more predisposed to having these type of experiences. And that's because on the whole, their ego is less solid than the male ego. So it, it, it's more prone to being shattered. And so again, as I work through those factors, thought, whew, we, I think we might have a four out of four checklist here. Um, and so, yeah, so I kind of swept all that up together and, and wrote my article, which is actually the most popular blog on my blog. <laughs> um, and it just gives us a different way of looking at Anne in those final, final few hours of her life. You just tied it up in such a perfect bow that I hate now that I have to go back and ask you another question. <laughs> go for it. I had mentioned earlier, and the only reason why I'm going back right now is just because I had mentioned earlier that I wanted to talk just briefly on, um, you know, Anne was facing her own mortality and she was processing everything that was happening around her, including the execution of her brother. Now, the stories that we always hear is that Anne watched her brother being executed. Can you just briefly go into whether or not she witnessed this? And if we know how she felt on the day of her brother's execution, was she already, do you think, to the Enlightenment? Or what do you yeah, think? Yeah, I can talk. Absolutely. So, yes, um, it is 
or one of the stories is that Anne Boleyn was forced or taken to watch her brother's execution. Uh, now, if you know anything about the layout of the tower, if she was to do that, I think I think the most most folk believe that she would have had to have been in the taken from the royal apartments to the bell tower which is in the kind of the far left hand corner if you look at the tower from its river frontage and that's where the likes of sir thomas more was imprisoned and and um i just don't i i really don't buy into the fact that she was probably moved across the tower in broad daylight it's possible. It is absolutely possible. But I never found out anything that really convinced me that she saw the execution. But she certainly interrogated Master Kingston after the event. He came to see her to kind of inform her what had happened and what was going on. And really, um, from the accounts, Anne very calmly asked if the men had died well, which, of course, was an incredibly important thing in Tudor times to die well. Um, uh, partly here, it was also about had they confessed to having, you know, adulterous relations with Anne or not, had they kind of kept a clear conscience and told the truth? And it was only Mark, poor Mark Smeaton, who was obviously the musician who'd been tortured by Cromwell, who kind of hinted that he'd, he deserved to die. The others kept to a more kind of traditional pitch, if you like, about, you know, sort of um, dying and dying in Christ and, and, you know, speaking good words about the king. That was just a traditional thing to do, but they certainly didn't confess any guilt. And I think Anne was, um, from the words that are recorded, she, she was content, let's put it, I wouldn't say happy. She was, she met it with grace and at this stage dignity. So, I do believe, Rebecca, actually, that by this phase, whether she'd had this high intensity awakening experience, not yet, I don't know if that happened exactly when, but I think she'd certainly gone through those four stages. And I think at that stage, she was in the acceptance stage. And I think there's, from my, from my reading of accounts, there's nothing to say otherwise. Thank you. Now we've reached the fun part of the show. Okay, we were we were already having fun, but this is the game portion. Uh, it's called If I Made You Choose. So if you haven't heard of this game before, basically what I do is I give you two characters from Tudor history and make you choose between them and then briefly give me an answer why you chose that person. Okay, yeah, right. I'm ready. <laughs> the first one is Henry VIII or Elizabeth I. Henry VIII, because I'd like to give him a piece of my mind. <laughs> <laughs> All right, the next one, this one should be interesting as well. Wolsey or Cromwell? Oh, that is hard. And it's hard because I've just done my virtual summit on Wolsey. So I, I had to do a deep dive into his life. And he turns out to be a much more interesting character than I thought. But Actually, I think I have to come down on the side of Cromwell. I'm I'm developing a bit of a fascination with Cromwell because although he was Anne's nemesis, maybe because he was Anne's nemesis, um, I just am rather fascinated by his life story and his clear political genius. And he was a a really cultured, multi talented, shrewd individual, and. Um, I wrote a blog on his uh, city home, Austin Friars, and I'd love to go and take a wander through the Tudor city of London and have a knock on his Austin Friars house and go in and uh, enjoy a little a glass of something with him and interrogate him as well, basically. <laughs> All right. The next one is let's look at the women who bookended Anne Boleyn, Catherine of Aragon or Jane Seymour. Oh, I, I definitely Catherine of Aragon. I I have very little time for Jane Seymour. So it's more of a push than a pull, interestingly, here, because Jane Seymour, I think, was as sh conniving and shrewd as Anne is often accused to be. But Anne never tried to pretend any, to be anything that she wasn't. I think Jane coated herself in sweetness and sugar and pretended to be this sort of uh, holier-than-thou character. And I find that quite difficult to get on with. So I would uh, much rather have a bit of a chat with Catherine of Aragon. <laughs> 
Okay, well, let's stick with the Seymours now. The last one, which is my favorite one that everybody has to pick <laughs> from, either Thomas Seymour or Edward Seymour. Got to be Thomas. Um, you know, I like a good flirt. So um, I think he'd be up for that. I don't know whether you'd agree with me. <laughs> um, but um, he's a colourful character and he's charismatic. And uh, I think he would make a great dinner guest. And so on that basis, I'd like to send him a dinner invitation. Sarah, thank you so much for being on the show today. Oh, you're welcome. I've had loads of fun. Thank you so much for inviting me. Can you tell everybody where they can listen to your podcast, where they can find you on social media, etc.? Absolutely. So, yes, my podcast is called The Tudor History and Travel Show, and you can find it on where you get your podcasts. Um, and my blog is the Tudor Uh You will find me on uh, mainly Instagram and Facebook. If you search on The Tudor Travel Guide, you will find me. Oh, I'm also on YouTube as well. I'm a bit of a YouTuber, so um, I've got a growing portfolio of uh, videos on there. And again, just search The Tudor Travel Guide. So, searching me, The Tudor Travel guide on most social media will pick me up thanks for listening to this episode of the tudor's dynasty podcast you can follow and support the tudor's dynasty podcast on facebook twitter instagram and patreon at tudor's dynasty